message I preach the first week of the year, and uh, I decided as we are coming into the fourth quarter uh, of this year to sort of come back and remind us of what we were talking about when we started the journey in 2018. How many of you make new... How many of you make New Year's resolutions? A few honest people, okay. What happens when you make a New Year's resolution or you have a goal or a dream that you set before you? In the beginning of the year, it's exciting to be able to do that. And so you write them out. And then what happens two, three months down the line is since, since nothing has taken place, a lot of people say, well, I'll wait until next year until next January so I can go back and redo my goals and my dreams and my resolutions. And I want to encourage you to recognize that the new year is a nice thing, but every day is a new opportunity. So we have a fresh new opportunity to start over. Just because you didn't follow through the first three months of the year, that doesn't mean the rest of the year goes by. You can come back and you can review you can renew those goals and dreams and actually set them again. So I want us to go back to what we talked about in, um, in January and share a little bit about this whole sense of uh, this is a new day. We started with this is a new year, but today I want to say this is a new day, which marks a fresh new opportunity to do a couple of things, to center or to focus our lives around the goodness of God. To be able to focus our lives or center our lives around the goodness of God. I pray that as we begin to look towards this new day and the rest of the year, that we will be open to God's perspective. That we will make space. Again, I've talked about this whole sense of making space because a lot of times we are so much in a rush that we do not make space for God to speak to us, for God to open our eyes so we can have this sense of different perspective. God is such a creative God. God is so awesome. And sometimes we limit him in what he can do because we stop at what we can do. See, there's a lot more that God can do in our lives and through our lives if we would just be open to his perspective. So I want us to make space to gain God's perspective, and I want us to be able to ground and anchor our hopes and pursuits on his grace, and so that we may celebrate all that God has done, is doing, and will continue to do today, the rest of this year, and the rest of our lives. Now, 2018 has been very uh, exciting because our theme verse is, I will watch, as for me, I will watch expectantly for the Lord. I will wait for the God of my salvation. My God will hear me. Now, that has, that has transformed how we, we see church and how we do church because we've been coming with, a, with an attitude of expectancy, trusting that God will fulfill what he says he will. Now, I want to tell you coming into 2018, it was, it was a little bit of a dark time for us. And we, we talked about transitions. Uh, we, we were just going through a process where our trustee board had gone to a level that uh, we had to do something. And uh, I, just so uh, confession time, right? I'm thinking, I think the trustee board is going to have to be combined with the deacon board for us to survive until God showed us something different. God brought us people that have all kinds of background and experiences that has sort of catapulted to a different level. We, we, we decided to do an onboarding process, which we've never done before. And that onboarding process caused us to go back to where we started from. Now, many of you are sitting in this sanctuary, and you have no idea where we came from. And because you have no idea where we came from, you may not appreciate it as much or, or trust God as much because you don't know where we came from. And yesterday in our all-ministry meeting, uh, all ministry meeting uh, I did that sort of that presentation again, reminding people, helping them to see where we came from. So that way, when I talk to you about what God can do, uh, you may think I'm crazy, but I believe God has done something incredible with Mount Hope Community Baptist Church. I have, I have a, 
a, a, a baseline to, to measure that. I know what God has done, and so therefore I trust him. We, we hired a full-time children and youth director, which just began to transform the whole process of how we do uh, children's ministry. The music technology changed. Some of you may not be aware of what happened, but uh, they've gone to a conference and they came back and says, you know, there's some things we can do. And all of a sudden, because we were watching expectantly, God provided new ways of doing things. And this year has been awesome in our music. I mean, our music has always been great, uh, but this year it just came up to a different level. So I believe this is all to catapult us to a new, uh, a new place and how we do church, and how we, uh, we experience God. And I want to encourage you to continue to watch expectantly for what God will do. You know, some changes will take place, already started to take place. Some of those changes you will like. Some of the changes you will not like. But in the end, I think we will enjoy all of them. Because God is bringing us to a new place. Rick Warren says, there is no growth without change. There's no change without loss. And there's no loss without pain. All right? There is no growth without change. If you want to stay the same way, then you're not going to change. If you want to go somewhere else, you have to change. So there's no growth without change. There's no change without loss. And there's no loss without pain. And as I was thinking about it, I, I thought about a little baby, right? A little baby's born, and before you know it, something's happening to their gums. What's happening? They're teething, right? Very uncomfortable, right? But that prepares them to be able to chew some foods. And then what happens to those teeth? They fall off, and we pay them money for it. I don't understand why. Right? But they, they fall off so new teeth can come up, stronger teeth that can actually bite, you know, pieces of meat, right? And there's some of you right now wishing there was a way for a third wave of teeth to come out, right? But this is part of the process. This is part of the process. Everything changes. There's a little discomfort, but the discomfort brings you something better. And then there's a loss, and then it changes again to bring you to a different place. In 2015, we, I went back sort of look at some of the theme verses that we had, and this is one of those that I really enjoyed from 1 Chronicles 28.20. Then David said to his son Solomon, so let me just give you a backdrop over here. Uh, King David had done a lot for God. He, he was a man after God's own heart. And uh, he got to the place of recognizing, you know what, we all have homes. We ha all have, you know, beautiful places to, to live and so on. How about God? Why, why, why doesn't God have a fixed place? Why doesn't God have a temple that we can worship in? And he says, then I will build a temple. And they said, go ahead, build a temple for God. And then the prophet said to him, uh, well, God has different plans. God does not want you to build the temple. But he has said, your son will be able to build the temple. And, and I want you to, to think about something here because this is really important. Uh, he couldn't build the temple, but his son was going to build the temple. So what did he do? He provided everything necessary to build the temple for his son. In order for his son to succeed, he provided all those things. So let's go to 1 Chronicles 20, uh, 8 to 20. It says, then David said to his son Solomon, be strong and courageous and what? And act. It says, do not fear nor be dismayed, for the Lord God, my God, is with you. He will not fail you nor forsake you until all the work for the service of the house of the Lord is finished. And I, I want to focus on one particular aspect here because this is really important. It says, David said to his son Solomon, be strong and courageous and act. So strong, courageous act because we're always going to be uh, faced with some fears and, and anxieties and uh, all doubts and all kinds of stuff. But it says be strong, be courageous, and go ahead and act. 
Do not fear nor be dismayed. For, listen to this here. For the Lord God, and then he says, my God. Why do you think he said my God? Because he experienced his God. He knew his God. So he's encouraging his son, the Lord God, not just any God, my God, the one that's been with me all these years, right? He is with you. He is with you. And he will not fail you nor forsake you until all the work for the service of the house of the Lord is finished. Now, we all work, you know, everything that we accomplish, we, we never accomplish it by ourselves. Uh, we, we accomplish what we accomplish because we stand in the, uh, on the shoulders of giants. And I want to show you a picture. If um, they will get it to me. Nice picture. Wait for it. Wait for it. All right, wait, where did the picture go? They don't have it. They lost it. Well, the picture that I had was a picture of Abel Azevedo, Reverend Rodriguez, and Pastor Holbert, and myself, all in one shot in front of the, in front of the church. And I, I, I just saw the picture yesterday on the wall. And so I was able to just t look at it and just recognize once again, the people that came before me, the people that encouraged me, the people that helped me to be able to be what I am today. There you go. All right. So look at that. If you don't recognize the one on the, on the right, that, that's, a, that's a former uh, Patriots fullback. But again, that's, that's, that's the picture of people that come before you that prepare the way for you. And this is important because I want to challenge us because we want to be able to prepare the way for other, other generations to come. You know, we, we, we made some great progress. We have renovated this whole altar. We did all these things. But something sort of uh, I was a little concerned about is once we build this new altar, I, ha I had this, this, this concern that we might sort of say, well, we've done such a great thing. Let's sit back, relax, and enjoy it. And I've shared this before, and um, that's exactly what we did. We sat back. This is the third year, right? By now, we should have had the money to buy the house that was on sale not too long ago right behind us that we've been looking for. But there's a sense that, you know, we've asked people for money, to build all the stuff, and we should stop asking for money because they may not have it. But I want to tell you something. I will always ask because the people that contributed to the altar were people that were here brand new. People that we had no idea could afford the amounts that they gave. They gave generously because God, when he has a purpose, when he has direction for his church, he will provide and, and I want us to have that mentality. We can't stop. We have to continue to move forward. And we need to be courageous in asking. I don't know what, what God has done in your life and, and how you want to just, you know, bless him. But our, our, our responsibility as the older generation is to be able to make a way for the new generation to do what needs to be done. See, I'm going to put myself in the older generation, right? I'm going to be with some of you. We get accustomed to certain things. We want to keep them the certain way, and we don't want to move forward. True. Okay, right. Okay, so we're good. We're honest. As I was thinking about it, and I just want to give you a, a – just reframe it for you a little bit. When, when I was young, some time back, how many of you remember Rocky Point? All right, so we're all in the same place. And then Six Flags, right? We, we had these, these theme parks. So we used to go to these theme parks. We, as church group, youth group and so on, had a wonderful time. You know, we had a blast. 
We didn't mind waiting in line for an hour to get to a ride that's 90 seconds, right? It is still happening today. Uh, and we enjoyed it, and I enjoyed it, until Kelsey was born. Right? When Kelsey was born, and she started walking, and she started able to go to some rides, you know every theme park has a kitty land. Right? So when she was growing up, my joy was not me doing the rides. My joy was watching her go on the rides. My joy was watching her get, reaching that, that bar that says you can ride if you're this high. And it's not going up and up. Right? That became my joy. It was no longer about me. It was about can I see her have some fun. And so I want us as the older generation to be able to sort of recognize that the church has to move forward. And let's sort of, instead of bucking the system, instead of getting upset with the changes and so on, to say, you know, I'm going to enjoy watching this new generation enjoy God. Because the new generation is enjoying God. They want God. All right? But we need to allow them some room. One of these days, you'll see somebody over here preaching without a suit jacket and without a tie. It won't be me. But, I mean, it's going gonna, it's gonna to happen. Right? We, we, we need to recognize that there's a generation coming after us. What we've enjoyed is awesome. Now let's find pleasure in what they enjoy. Because they're still worshiping God with us. So, uh, that's just, just a, a thought for us to just process. In, in uh, 2016, our theme verse was Isaiah 43, 18 and 19a. It says, forget the former things. Do not dwell in the past. See, I am doing a new thing. God is doing a new thing every single day. God is the same yesterday, today, and forever, but he's moving forward. And he's asking us to move forward with him. He's asking us to allow his creativity to continue. It doesn't have to be stifled because we're only used to one thing. We want to be able to get to the place where we forget the former things. We don't dwell in the past. We use the past as an example, but we look at the future. And what is God asking of us for the future? So in 2017, our, our verse was 1 Corinthians 15:58. It says, Therefore, my beloved brethren, be steadfast immovable, always abounding in the work of the Lord, knowing that your toil is not in vain in the Lord. And I used to choose all the theme verses for the year. And then we came as a deacon board, and I said, you know, you guys pick a theme verse. And each one of them picked one, and then we just pulled it, put it in a bowl, and we trusted God to pick the theme verse. And whichever came, that's what we were going to go with. So this one came up. And it was very apt because I knew in 2017 that we were going to face some incredible challenges. And the encouragement was, my beloved, be steadfast, immovable, always abounding in the work of the Lord, knowing that your toil is not in vain in the Lord. That was a confirmation. And we have, we've gone by it. That dark cloud that was over us is sort of passing by. We, we, you know, as we started 2018, it was a, a new year with new expectations as we, we looked, we watched expectantly for what God was going to do. And so this is our verse for this year. And it says, but as for me, I will watch expectantly. I will wait for the God of my salvation. My God will hear me. And I broke it down in three, three phases. But before I, I go into that, I want to give you the, the backdrop of Micah. Micah was coming to the people of Israel with a warning. He was saying to the people of Israel, as you read Micah from chapter 1 on, he, he was telling the people of Israel, you have been disobedient. And because you have been disobedient, you will be disciplined. And there was some great discipline coming down in, if you read Micah 1, uh, chapter 1, verses 1 through 5. But at the same time, he gave them hope. He says, from you, Bethlehem. The Savior will be born. Even though God sometimes really is displeased with us, I want you to know that he's, he still has hope for us. 
And if you would trust him, if we sometimes receive his discipline, you know, whenever things are not going right in my life, one of the first questions I ask, God, have I done something wrong? Have I done something wrong that's causing me this grief or this pain or this discomfort? And sometimes God says, no, you haven't done anything. This is just part of a process. I want to train you and test you. But sometimes it's because I've done something wrong and God shows it to me. I can repent and move forward. And so whenever something is happening, that's my first question. And if, if that's a no, it's, if everything's okay, you've been tested, then I trust God. If it's a yes, then I just confess and ask God to forgive me. So we were expecting a breakthrough in 2018. And we've seen a whole bunch of breakthroughs. This year has been incredible. And it's been incredible because we have been looking expectantly to see what God's going to do. In every aspect of the church, things are changing. God is bringing us to a different level. And we want to thank God for that. So as we look at this theme verse, it says, but as for me, that means my individual choice, as for me, as for me as an individual, as for me as a family, as for me as a church, as for me, we have to take some sense of ownership here. We can't separate our success from the kingdom of God and his success. And what, what I'm saying here is that all of us, as we begin the year, we, ex we, we want to succeed in whatever we're doing. And sometimes when we succeed, we push God aside. And so we just sort of enjoy the success that's shallow, that's empty, no satisfaction. So we have our time and treasure and talents sort of pulled away from God because we're so focused on succeeding in our own lives. And just to go back to, to, to Micah here, uh, God just didn't like what they were doing because they were being very selfish with their resources. They were being disobedient in their idolatry. All these things were happening, and God was going to punish them. And so when I talk about, about success and, and our, our responsibility to the kingdom of God, uh, in Malachi 3.8, it says, Will a man rob God? And it says, Yet you are robbing me. But you say, How have we robbed you? It says, In tithes and offerings. And one of the things, again, as we succeed in life, sometimes we figure, you know, I better hold on to some here. God, I know you gave me all this stuff here. I know you want me to trust you, but I'm going to hold on to this because I want to trust in this first. That's a dangerous place to be because the more generous you are, and some of, some of, some of us will be in financial difficulty because we have not practiced trust in giving what belongs to God. I want, I, want, I want you to know that. When people come to my office and tell me about their financial troubles, the first thing I ask them is, do you tithe? It doesn't matter if you're making $100 a week, $1,000 a week, or $10,000 a week. It doesn't matter. If you're not tithing, you can expect that you're going to have financial difficulties. And I want to go even further because when you think you have plenty and your security is in all that you have, Micah 6 because God, you know, God was warning them. Micah 6, 14 and 15 says this. You will eat, but you will not be satisfied. How many of you have gone out to, to dinner and had a very expensive meal, and then all you had was heartburn? Usually comes after you see the bill. Right? What good is a, an expensive meal when you can't digest it? God says to them, you will eat but you will not be satisfied. And your vileness will be in your midst. You will try to, re to remove for safekeeping, but you will not preserve anything. And what you do preserve, I will give to the sword. Some of us think that we can sort of hide it from God. We, we, we're going to put some aside, even though God wants us to trust him. He says, you will try to remove for safekeeping, but you will not preserve anything. And what and what you do preserve, I will give to the sword. Verse 15 says, you will sow, but you will not reap. You will tread the olive, but you will not anoint yourself with oil. You will tread the grapes, but you will not drink the wine. My friends, again, this is part of, of Micah 
and his warning to the people of Israel and his warning to us today. Let's trust God. Let's learn to trust God with everything because we can't outgive God and you can't save enough for your own security because God says if we don't give back to him, even what we have tried to, to hide, he will destroy. So our breakthrough is going to come only when we trust God fully. But as for me, I will watch expectantly for the Lord. I love the song that we sang, through it all, my eyes are on you. It is well with my soul. That sense of optimism. We need to have this optimistic outlook. I will watch expectantly. Now, I, I want to make a point here because I think this is really important. As we started the year and we're talking about expecting God to move, and uh, he has moved in incredible ways. You have seen it through the services. For those of you that have been here on Thursday night, God has been moving in ways that are just blowing our minds. All right? But when we talk about watching expectantly, some of us may be thinking all the good things that are going to come. And to a certain extent, some good stuff are going to come that's evident that it's good stuff. But there's some good stuff that's going to come as an outcome of some very difficult things that God's going to bring into your life. And for some of you, 2018 has been very difficult. You have suffered losses. Loss of jobs, maybe. Loss of lives. Loss of all kinds of things. Been diagnosed with things. Your prognosis has not been good. All these things. Through it all, my eyes are on you. It is well with my soul. The optimism is not only for the good things. The optimism is also to see that even when bad or difficult things happen, I'm still going to trust God with those things. And so I don't, I don't want you to take, it for, uh, to, to take it any other way that, yes, even through the difficult times, God is watching over you. You can still watch expectantly. You can still have optimism because God is going to turn whatever the devil wanted for evil He's going to turn for good if you're watching expectantly. Now, there's no greater optimistic uh, passage than Habakkuk 3.17 uh, and following. It says this, though the fig tree should not blossom and there be no fruit on the vines, though the yield of the olive should fail and the fields produce no food, though the flock should be cut off from the fold and there be no cattle in the stalls, Yet I will exalt in the Lord. I will rejoice in the God of my salvation. The Lord God is my strength. He has made my feet like hind's feet and makes me walk on high places. Even though there's, there's nothing, there's no fig on the tree, even though there's no fruit on the vine, even though there's no olives, even though there's no food, even though there's no flock, there's no, you know, cattle, there's nothing, even though you can't see it. He says, yet I will extol, exalt in the Lord, I will rejoice in the God of my salvation. That is the ultimate test of faith and optimism and trust that God is in control. Now, one of the ways we can look at this is the fact that when you're not seeing anything, it's like when you are driving and, and the road is like foggy, right? And you can't see anything in front of you. But as you keep moving forward, you keep seeing a little bit more. And all I want to say to you is trust God and keep moving forward. You know, when it's foggy, sometimes you move slower. That's okay. But just trust that God is with you. He has not abandoned you. Watch expectantly. Have that sense of optimism that God is a faithful God. So, but as for me, I will watch expectantly for the Lord. I will wait for the God of my salvation. This means practicing patience. And you know, when, uh, when, I, when I see people, especially with chronic illnesses and so on, uh, I, I feel, I feel their pain a little bit. Because if I'm sick for two weeks, I'm just like, I'm wondering, you know, what, what waste of two weeks? How about two months? How about two years? How about 20 years? We need to trust God. We need to continue to trust God. 
Psalm 13 is a, you know, it's a very encouraging psalm because even David, right, the man after God's own heart, he says this, How long, O Lord, will you forget me forever? How long will you hide your face from me? How long shall I take counsel in my soul, having sorrow in my heart all the day? How long will my enemy be exalted over me? Consider and answer me, O Lord my God. Enlighten my eyes, or I will sleep the sleep of death. And my enemy will say, I have overcome him. And my adversaries will rejoice when I am shaken. But I have trusted in, the loving, in your loving kindness. My heart shall rejoice in your salvation. I will sing to the Lord because he has dealt bountifully with me. You know, sometimes we ask the question, how long, Lord? And I want you to know, if you're asking that question, don't beat yourself up. Don't beat yourself up. Because sometimes it feels like God has forgotten us. God has hidden his face from us. But that's just in our minds. God loves us. God is watching over us. God feels our pain. And we need to sort of, we need to sort of trust that he's going to be there. And so for, for those of us who may be in a different place, when we see somebody else struggling with how long, let's not preach a sermon to them about being unfaithful to God. Let's sort of lean with them and say, I'm going to pray with you. Okay, because today it's them, tomorrow it's you. The next day, it's me. We are all going to be in that place. How long? I will wait for the God of my salvation. Why? Because he will hear me. He will hear my prayers. He will hear your prayers. God has not forgotten his children. And I want you to be encouraged by that. The Bible says in Ecclesiastes 3.1, there is an appointed time for everything, and there's a time for, uh, for every event under heaven. There's a time. In Galatians 4.4, it says, but when the fullness of time came, God sent forth his son, born of a woman, born under the law. When, when the fullness of time came, God has a perfect plan, and he is always on time. But we sometimes ask the question, how long? And again, I don't want you to beat yourself up. I just want you to recognize, as you say how long, to continue to exalt the name of God, to continue to praise him, because that really frustrates the devil when you can sing the praises of God in the midst of your difficult situation. That's, that, that's where music is so powerful. That's where the word is so powerful. Because, you know, one of the things that I do is read scripture out loud when I'm going through a difficult time. It's like singing if I had a good voice. Reading the word is just as powerful. And I want to encourage you to be able to do that. But as for me, this is an individual, also corporately as a family or as a church, I will watch expectantly for the Lord. That means we need to practice optimism. Trust that things are going to get better. God is in control. You're a child of God. You matter to God. I will wait for the God of my salvation. That means I will practice patience. Because I know without a shadow of a doubt that my God will hear me. This is where we exercise faith and trust and conviction that my God, as David said to his son, my God is with you. And we need to encourage one another as we think about these things. Psalm 94 says, verse 12, says, Bless, blessed is the man whom you, you chasten, O Lord, whom you teach out of your law, that you may grant him relief from the days of adversity until a pit is dug for the wicked. Even though we may be going through a difficult time, God is preparing the way whoever is attacking us, whatever is attacking us, will be put in that, in, in that pit. Verse 17 of the same text says, If the Lord had not been my help, if the Lord had not been my help, my soul would soon have uh, dwelt in the abode of silence. 
If I should say my foot has slipped, your loving kindness, O Lord, will hold me up. When my anxious thoughts multiply within me, your consolations delight my soul. Even David knew what it meant to have to be patient, to ask God how long, but to trust that God will be there with him. So as we finish this year, I want you to review your goals, your dreams, your aspirations, the things that God puts in your heart in the beginning of the year and say, God, what can we do for the rest of this this year here, in the next three months, what do I need to do? What do you have in mind for me? We need to be a little bit more like Mary than Martha in this, in this next quarter. You know, maybe we've gone the first three quarters of the year and we've been just running around. We haven't given God a chance to sort of uh, give that space for God to minister. And that maybe this last quarter here, we need to refocus and let God minister to us. Let's be like, like Mary that did not worry about just everything around her, but that sat at Jesus' feet to listen to what he was saying. I want to encourage us to go to that place. And, ask our, and I want to ask you the question, are you still expecting a breakthrough in 2018? Because I'm still expecting a breakthrough. There's wonderful things that's happened. I'm still expecting something to happen because God is working every single day. Again, Micah 7, 7 says, but as for me, I will watch expectantly for the Lord. I will wait for the God of my salvation. My God will hear me. And I hope that you have a sense of conviction about the fact that he will hear you. Let us bow our heads. you have your heads bowed and eyes closed. Only you know your situation better than anybody else. But I want you to know that God knows what you're going through as well. And maybe there's some of you here as you're going through this. You don't know God personally enough to say, God, help me. Maybe some of you have not come to that place where you've accepted Jesus Christ as your Lord and Savior. Maybe this is the opportunity for you. So you know that somebody's watching over you. Is there anyone just by raising your hand will say, I want to accept Jesus Christ as my Lord and Savior. I want to turn my life over to him. that place where we have accepted Jesus Christ as our Lord and Savior. I want to just address those of you that are going through a difficult time to know that God has not forgotten you. That he is watching over you. That he wants to strengthen you. That he wants to take whatever difficulty it is and turn it into something wonderful if you would just continue to watch expectantly. For those of you that have got, gotten some breakthroughs this year, I want to encourage you, don't stop thanking God. Don't stop thanking God for what he's done in your life. Continue to bless his holy name. Gracious God, once again, we, we thank you for this fresh new opportunity that you've given us. Because every day when you wake us up, it is a fresh new opportunity. Father, help us to be able to go back and, and recognize that you have put certain things in our hearts in January, things that you wanted to accomplish through us and in us and for us that have gone by the wayside. Father, we thank you that we have a new opportunity to revisit those, those things that you put in our hearts. Father, I pray that you help each one of us to be able to make space for you to minister. Allow us to slow down, to sit at your feet so that we may hear more clearly from you. Father, we just want to thank you for this day and 
being able to come together and to worship. Thank you for your presence. Father, as we go from here, help us to recognize that you go with us. You watch over us. We want to thank you for that. We want to ask your blessing upon each of our lives, each of our family members. For this, your church, for this community, for this country, Lord, for the world, in the midst of all the tragedies that are going on. May you allow your peace to be acknowledged and recognized. We ask your blessings in Jesus' name. Amen.